And so 1 Peter chapter number 4, we'll begin reading in verse number 7. The Bible says, But the end of all things is at hand. Then he pauses. Well, we ought to take time to think about that. You know, we're to make plans and goals, uh, but we're to never lose sight of the fact that his plan's the ultimate goal. I wouldn't make too many plans for too many long-term goals, because I don't know how long we're going to be here. But the end of all things is at hand. Now, in respect to that, look what Peter writes. Be ye therefore sober. And watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies, the sweet spirit in the house of God. God, I know that your people have labored on their jobs this week and they've had to deal with this whole wicked world. And then, Lord, we got news of those 19 precious children whose lives were taken. And God, there's so much turmoil and tragedy in this old world that it weighs us down. Because, Lord, we have a burden to see everybody saved. We have a burden to see everybody worshiping and praising our darling Savior. Lord, we get so vexed dealing with the sin and wickedness of this world. And so, Father, as we come tonight, many are tired in body. But, Lord, I pray that you would certainly refresh their spirit. I pray that you'd bless them abundantly for being in the house of God. And, God, I certainly pray that, you, Lord, you'd blow through here and strengthen us. Help us not to be hearers only of the word of God but help us to become doers of it and help us in light and in lieu of the fact that we're on the brink of your coming to be found faithful and be found living and walking by faith now father bless bless your people use this unworthy vessel and certainly do a work in our hearts and we'll bless you for it for it's in the holy name of Jesus we ask these things amen and amen in the first epistle Peter writes, he's writing it to Christians and especially saved Jews who've been scattered all over uh, the known part of the world. This first epistle, he deals with suffering 15 times. And can I say, if you live for Jesus, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer because the devil hates you. You're going to suffer because the world doesn't understand you. And you're going to suffer because you're going to put your flesh uh, under condemnation to the Spirit of God. You're going to nail it down and not to have the flesh have its way. And a lot of your decisions won't be popular. And a lot of them are going to even go against your own reasoning. But my dear friends, aren't you glad we have the Word of God to lead us and guide us? into all truth, and to show us the ways of righteousness and peace. But as we get down to chapter 4, Peter uh, begins to expound on some things. And I want you to notice in these verses, Peter exhorts us as believers to first of all be on the lookout. In verse number 7 he says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now to be sober means more than not be given to toxic or intoxicating beverages it means to be clear of thought not to be caught up in the noise of the hour but be sober and watch unto prayer we ought to have an attitude of prayer 
Paul wrote that we're to pray without ceasing. We're to pray for sinners to be saved. We're to pray for the peace and power of God. We're also to pray for our enemies and those that despitefully use us. Uh, and it's okay to pray as John prayed, even so, Lord, come quickly. Uh, but uh, we're to be sober. We're to be on the lookout. Uh, we're not to be ostriches with our heads buried in the sand. Uh, a lot of the freedoms that we once enjoyed in America is because uh, churches and Christians quit being Christians uh, and acting like churches, uh, quit uh, 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 ringing the, uh, the bells of righteousness and proclaiming the holiness of God. Uh, we quit living holy lives, uh, and therefore our society has gotten more and more wicked. Uh, we're to watch, we're to be on the lookout, watch unto prayer. But notice... Uh, he also exhorts us that we're to love. Look what he says in verse number 8. And above all things, have fervent charity. That means a passionate love among yourselves. For charity or love shall cover the multitude of sins. We're to love one another. We're to love one another in spite of one another. The Bible says in Ephesians that God has fitly framed us together. Every local assembly, if it's preaching the Bible and living by the Bible and exalting, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, God adds to the tr church daily such as should be saved, uh, but He also uh, begins to build that work and puts us together together. Uh, just like blocks that are put together for a wall, uh, and for mortar, that's the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and that's amazing how God has grabbed us from all kinds of different backgrounds, different uh, 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 teachings that we were raised with, different ideologies. Uh, we've got different levels of education, different statuses as far as what people make as far as monetary, all kinds of things. We come from everywhere. Mm, be honest with you, we're a bunch of mutts that God's brought together. Now, outside the good grace of God, very few of us see eye to eye on very, very few things. But in the grace of God, we have a kindred spirit. And what he is teaching is that we're to lay aside personality differences and we're to have fervent charity one for another. Because charity covereth the multitude of sins. If your love's right, you'll overlook people's faults. Do you ever see a mama that can find no fault in her children? But everybody else sees them as little devils? Why is that? Because that mama loves that child. And when we love properly in the house of God, we won't be nitpicking and looking for people's faults. We'll be building one another up. We'll say, that's my brother, that's my sister. Uh, I love them uh, in spite of their little twerks and little problems. Huh? And that's the way we should be. And can I say, that's one thing I'm very proud of in our church. We love one another. Our church is really a family atmosphere. And isn't that what all churches should be? Brother Jerry preaching Sunday night said, he said, I just feel at home here. Isn't that what Christians should feel at home in the house of God? But can I say, I've been invited to places to preach. They only come up, shake your hand, introduce themselves. I mean, you know, and it's, it's, it's like pulling teeth. Boy, church ought to, ought to be like home. Church ought to feel like a good old house shoe. Mm. Just ought to fit and feel good. Hmm. Mm, we kick off them shoes we worked in all day and put on them house slippers and we in good company right there. When we kick off the world, come to the house of God, we ought to just be in good company. Are you listening? Uh, but we're to have love, fervent love, one for another. Can I say it's easy to find fault in people, but it takes letting God work in your life to find a way to love people. Mm. And then he deals with believers where to lend a hand. Look what he says in verse number 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hmm? 
you ever see a child that goes and does what his parents told him to do and all the time underneath his breath he's going rub, 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 rub. I don't know this to be true but I kind of figure some of you boys are that way around here hmm? let's see huh? Uh, Xander you're getting called out but I think you're in good company I can see Lucas being the same way Tommy have you ever told Lucas to do something and he's like rub, 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 rub. huh what are you looking at you're the same way huh I can see it guilty and you put both hands up huh but some of you girls are the same way too well, in the things of God, when God tells us to do something, we're not to go stomping and do it grudgingly. We're to say, hallelujah. The Lord wants me to do something. Huh? I mean, we ought to be in hell, but I'm not going to hell. And he, we've already heard he just didn't forgive me of my sins. He put me in the family. And it's a privilege that God would even think about us uh, let alone say, hey, I want you to do something for me. We ought to say, hallelujah, Lord. Uh, yes, let me do something for you. Uh, well, what are we to do? We're to lend a hand, but how, preacher? Well, he tells us. Can I say, first of all, we're to lend a hand by being welcoming. Look what it says in verse number 9. Use hospitality. We're to be welcoming. We ought to have a welcoming spirit about us. And another thing that I'm so proud of our church, it don't matter where people come from. We've had people come straight from jail. And they come in here and we'll shake their hand, make them feel welcome. We'll let them know we're glad to see them. That's being hospitable with the good grace of God. I've had folks that visit church, they visit other churches, they said, well, there's something about this place. Uh, everybody shook my hand. Well, isn't that the way it should be? Uh, I mean, listen, if you come over to my house, uh, and, and, and I, I'm not just going to sit on the, uh, on the couch and watch TV and ignore you. I'm going to get up and welcome you to our house. Uh, 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 ask anybody that's been to our house. We're going to give you something to eat, uh, give you something to drink. Uh, when it comes time for me to take a nap, I'm going to give you the remote. And I'm going to go take a nap, but I'm going to make you feel welcome, huh? But hey, isn't that the way we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be welcoming I'm glad our church is that way. But notice, we're also to lend a hand by being a witness. Look at verse 10. Verse number 10 says, As every man hath received the gift. What gift? The gift of salvation. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If you've received the good grace of God through the gift of salvation, uh, you're to be a good steward of that gift and share it with somebody else. Uh, you're to be a witness to somebody else. Uh, you're to minister to somebody else what God's done in your life. Paul wrote this uh, th this way, said, working out uh, uh, your own salvation. Uh, now, I'm not working to get saved, but what he's saying is that which God has put in you, uh, you're to work it out and give it out to other people. Uh, and we're to be ministers and good stewards. You say, preacher, I thought the ministers was a preacher. Well, you don't understand that term. In the Bible, you find that there were times the disciples would be in somebody's house and the women would minister unto them. What did that mean? The, mem the women would would uh, cook for them and clean for them uh, and offer uh, 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 to wash their feet and would minister unto them uh, so they could go and do what God called them to do. Uh, uh, throughout the Bible, you find folks that minister. Uh, you find that God sends angels to minister. Uh, uh, you find that uh, God calls men to stand and preach to minister. Uh, ministering just simply means uh, to help meet people's physical and spiritual needs. And we do that when we witness to folks and what God's done in our life. Now, let me help you something, because the devil intimidates people and say, well, I don't have a Bible education. I can't get up and tell people how to get saved. 
Well, friend, all you got to do is tell them how you got saved. Tell them what Jesus done for you. Tell them what garbage dump he found you in and how he changed your life and how he'll change their life. Uh, Brother Jerry was here the other night, uh, and he alluded to it a couple times. Uh, when Brother Rocky got out of jail, Brother Rocky, Brother Jerry, and Brother Rocky were best of friends. Uh, they used to be drinking buddies. They used to go fight chickens together. They did all that running together. Uh, Rocky got saved in jail. As soon as he got out, uh, he went and he looked up Brother Jerry, uh, and the first thing he told him, Brother Brian, is, Brother Jerry, Jesus loves you. Brother Rocky didn't give him a thesis and a dissertation on the plan of salvation. He didn't take him down the Romans road or any other path. He just told him Jesus loved him, and Brother Jerry couldn't get over it. And it changed his life because he found out Jesus did love him. And he got saved by the good grace of God. Uh, we're to lend a hand by being welcoming and by being a witness, but we're also to lend a hand by working. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. Now what's he talking about? It means if you're called to preach, you use the word of God. I don't need anything else. This is all I need right here. This is fully equipped. It was pinned down by holy men of God that the men of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Using the word of God. But then he goes on to say this. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He says, if you're to minister, you minister with the abilities that God has given you. In other words, if God hasn't given you the ability to do something, don't do it. If God hasn't given you the ability He's given somebody else, then don't try and do what somebody else is doing. Just take the abilities God has given you and use them to impact somebody else's life for Jesus Christ and His glory. And with that in mind, I'm interested in that very thought in verse 11. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. And I want to preach for just a few minutes tonight on this thought, the ministry of ministering. The ministry of ministering. You'll find 161 times in your King James Bible some form or fashion of the word minister. And can I say... God saved you to minister. God didn't just save you to take you to heaven. If He saved you to take you to heaven, He'd take you to heaven the moment He saved you. But He saved you to serve Him. He saved you to be a good steward of the grace of God that He saved you by. And He saved you to be a minister unto somebody else. So there is the ministry of ministering. Now let me give you what it takes to be a, a faithful minister, a good minister, and ministering to other people. Because if I'm going to tell you you need to be a minister, I need to help you be equipped to be a good minister. So you know what you're supposed to do, how to do it, and what it requires. Can I say ministering requires, first of all, a heart for ministry. Brother Sammy, Sammy just stood up here and talked about the burden he has for 44 million people in the Caribbean. It takes a heart to minister. If you don't have a burden for somebody, you'll never help them. Hmm. You know, I could take Aiden. It's all right, Aiden. I believe what is best for your life is for you to learn to play the cello. And I want you to practice it eight hours a day, every day, even on Sunday. So come to church, then practice for four hours. Come back to church, then practice for four hours when you get home. And on school days, when you get home, practice for, four, for eight hours every day, the cello. Because I think you and the cello would look good together. 
Now, really, do you think he'll be an effective cello player? He might if he practices eight hours and all that. But the truth of the matter is, if he doesn't have a heart to learn to play the cello, he could put in eight hours a day every day, and he could be the worst cello player you ever heard because his heart's not in it. See, I could stand from behind God's sacred desk and start pulling you out and telling you what you need to do. But if your heart's not in it, you're not going to be very effective. Hmm? But when your heart's in it, you can minister to folks. Mm -mm. Can I say, mm, how do you have a heart for ministry, preacher? Well, first of all, you've got to get a heart for the Savior. Because if you've got a heart for Jesus, when Jesus asks you to do something, you'll be glad to do it. Mm? Matter of fact, in Luke 10, 27, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. When you love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, it's no problem serving him. You know why more people aren't out on Wednesday night? Let me qualify that. We've got some folks who are traveling. We've got some folks who are working. We've got some folks who are sick. But there's a whole lot of folks that could be here. You know why they're not here? They don't have a heart for the Savior. Now, you can have any other excuse you want to, but the bottom line is, you don't come to church, it's because you are allowing something else to be more important than Jesus in your life. When you don't minister and all you ever do is come to church, it's because you really don't have a heart for Jesus. You read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll find Jesus had a heart for people. And when you get a heart for Jesus, you'll get a heart for people. Hmm? Can I say, so many people sit on the stool of do nothing because their heart isn't where it should be. Now, I'm glad they come to church. But if all you do is come to church, you're falling way short. You need to come all the way to Jesus. Your heart needs to be in it. You need to have a heart for the Savior. When you've got a heart for the Savior, you'll be an effective minister. Can I say this? You not only have to have a heart for the Savior, you've got to have a heart for serving. Hmm. Now, I wouldn't embarrass her to, to save my life, but the truth of the matter is, if you've never watched my wife around a dinner around here, if she eats Sunday, it'll be well after everybody else has eaten. And it's not because she doesn't like to eat. It's because she finds more joy in making sure you eat. And she's not the only one. We got several ladies. Sunday. You watch them. They'll serve. They'll clean up. They won't complain. They'll have a smile on their face because they found a way they can minister and be a blessing to others. And they find joy and contentment in doing that. You'll find others that won't lift a finger. All they'll do is eat, and they'll leave. Why? They just don't have a heart for serving. Hmm? I understand serving takes work. And work is a four-letter word to a Baptist. Hmm? But if you've got a heart for the Savior, you'll have a heart to serve. You'll be glad to do anything for Him. And can I say, having a heart for the ministry, you've got to have a heart for the Savior, you've got to have a heart for serving, but then you get a heart for souls. You know why more people aren't saved in this world? Because more Christians don't have a burden. I wonder how many people would get saved if we had as much enthusiasm to see people get saved as we do to watch sports in America. Now, I like sports. Don't like all of them. You know what's on? We had Naj and Naren over and I, They like two things. We've turned Naj into a redneck. He likes racing. And they like soccer. And this one Sunday, racing and soccer wasn't on yet, and I'm scanning the channel. And there's arm wrestling competitions on on Sunday. And these behemoths of a guys, I mean, they about break each other's wrists arm wrestling. And they're in cycle. 
Never seen anything like that. They don't have that in St. Lucia. Huh? You can make a sport out of anything. I wonder if we got that excited about seeing people saved, how many more folks we'd see get saved. See, the ministry of ministering requires a heart for ministry. You know why some people come to church when they're sick? Now, I'm not talking about contagious, coughing up stuff that everybody else is going to get. I'm talking about they don't feel good, they're sick, they just had surgery, they just had a treatment. They, you know why they come on to church? Because they love church. It's real simple. It's because they don't want to miss. It takes a heart for ministry. Can I say ministry not only requires a heart for ministry, but it also requires helping the ministry. Can I say a lot of people get the mindset that the church is the pastor's church? I don't know how many times I've had to make it clear around here. There's no big eyes or little U's around here. We're all fitly framed together. God called me to be the pastor, and I have a role to fulfill in this local church. But even though it seems like my role may be more important than whoever empties the trash cans or whoever sweeps the floor or whoever takes care of the yard or whoever plants the flowers, and reality is uh, 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 we all have a job to do, and when we do what God expects us to do, God blesses the church. Because the truth of the matter is, I wouldn't be much of a pastor if I had to empty the trash and sweep the floors, which I have done both, by the way, mow the grass, which I have done, plant flowers, which I have done. I'm not, I'm not too good to do all that. I've cleaned toilets around here. I'm not too good to do it all. I mean, it's the house of God. I want it to be the nicest place on the block. And I'm willing to do uh, it, but uh, uh, the man of God's got to be given to the Word of God in prayer. And uh, when other people step up and take part, and we all uh, uh, do what we're supposed to do and help in the capacities we can help in and use the abilities God's given us, we'll have a great church. You know why so many p pastors are quitting the ministry? They're burnt out because they do it all. Them and their families do it all. You know why so many preachers quit, kids quit when they get a, up of age? Because they've had to spend all their life listening to people talk bad about their dad and then come out and still have to sweep the floors and empty the trash, and they had to do it all. They got burnt out. Hmm. I'm so grateful that you all have loved my kids all their lives. I mean, Miss Pam taught all my kids in the toddler class. I mean, you folks have your fingerprints. I'm glad you didn't badmouth me to my kids. I'm glad you didn't force my kids to do everything around here. And it's evident in their lives. But can I say, if we're going to do, truly be ministers, we've got to be helping in the ministry. You know what gets all over me? Can I just run a rabbit? It's people that never lift a finger to do anything, but they want to tell everybody else how to do it. That gets all over me. We once had a fella here. Remember Brother Ray? Every Wednesday and Sunday, he was telling us as we was building this building how we did it wrong, but he never drove one nail. Well, for us doing a bad job, she's held out pretty good for 17 years. Uh, I'm just trying to help you tonight to realize it takes helpers. We've got a head. His name is Jesus. He tells us how to and when to. Mm, we don't need a bunch of, bunch of chiefs. We just need a bunch of Indians getting busy and doing it. Are you listening? Hmm? So how can we help? Now, I want you to get a hold of this because this is important. This is important in the future of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Look what it said again in verse 11. Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. Everybody here has gifts and abilities. 
and you need to use them for God's glory. So how can you help in the ministry? We all can. We, we addressed you in Sunday school Sunday morning after Brother Sammy gave his presentation. We need to get involved. It's going to take all of us. I asked you all several years ago to get involved, and you stepped to the plate. Well, you're going to have to get involved again. How can we help in the ministry? Well, first of all, you can help in supplication. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Can I say not everybody's called to preach? Not everybody has the gift to teach. Not everybody has the talent that other people have to play an instrument or to sing. But everybody that's saved by the good grace of God can pray. And we all need to help in prayer. You need to do your part in prayer. Uh, uh, we need to become stewards of prayer. We need to make a, a, a habit of praying for the ministry and praying for souls and praying for uh, uh, St. Lucia and the Caribbean and praying uh, uh, for all of our missionaries and praying for our church family uh, and praying for revival and praying for God. Hey, if we'll do all that praying, it'll keep us out of a lot of trouble. We can all pray. We're commanded to pray. And can I say it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do? Because that's one area the devil will fight you the most in. Because prayer is where the power of God comes from. And when you make it a point that you're going to get down and pray, and if you make a schedule, I'm going to pray every day at this time, the devil will fight you harder at that time. You'll have a headache at that time. Uh, you'll be nauseous at that time. Uh, uh, the phone will ring at that time. I mean, there's constantly going to be uh, something to trip you up from praying. That ought to encourage you to pray more. If he's fighting you that hard to pray, that means God really wants to use your life. He's really wanting you to minister in the ministry of prayer you can help through supplication you can help through utilizing your skills again he says the ability which God's given us you have abilities you have skills you have gifts you have talents it may not be to sing it might be with a hammer it may not be able to uh, 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 stand and teach, but you may be a friendly person who can talk to people and invite them to church. You have something you can do. You may not be able to talk to people, but you may be able to drive. Hmm? Take that bus and go pick up people and bring them to church. I mean, there is something that you have that God can use for His glory. How can I help? Just do what you're good at. You know, most of us never see them because when we go to take up the offering on Sunday night, for years, two teenage boys will go get the garbage cans and wheel them down to the corner. Doesn't seem like much, but they're doing what they can. And I'm reminded about that when Mary broke that alabaster box, Jesus said, let her alone. She has done what she could. There's something you can do. Do what you're good at. How can I help in the ministry? Through supplication, through utilizing your skills. Just do what you're good at. Hmm? There's some people that are real good with technical stuff. Use that technical stuff. Do you realize there's a whole world out there that is online? And you might be able to do put something together that brings somebody to Christ? Do what you're good at. Hmm? Don't do what you can't do. Hmm? You end up in bad shape like me. There's still a scar on that wall where I fell down that wall when we was building this place. I fell in the baptistry. They don't let me on ladders around here no more. Hmm? That's not my wheel. I'm still giving it my best shot. Huh? Just do what you can do. Huh? Helping the ministry through supplication, through utilizing your skills, and if nothing else, through giving of your silver. It takes money to make a ministry work. Now, I don't know how we're going to win the Caribbean. He's got the burden. Brother Doug and I are putting together the plan. And I know Brother Doug's on the road a lot. Brother Doug does love souls, and he's working. 
to find a way to finance the thing. Where when we need to be somewhere and get something done, we can go and get it done. And uh, one thing I know about him, if he gets a nose for it, he'll find the money. But you can get involved. The first thing we told Brother Sammy is let's quit waiting on, the, on, on having a, a, a food processing plant in St. Lucia. We can be in the schools tomorrow, taking the gospel down there in the schools tomorrow. Let's worry about souls. The rest of it will come. Let's do what we can do. You can give your silver. Philippians 4, 16. Paul said, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Verse 17, Not because I desired a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You don't understand this, but those of you that give above your tithe and offerings to missions, when you get to heaven, there's going to be people from other countries, other kindreds, other bloods that are going to come up to you and are going to tell you, I'm here because you gave to missions. When I went to the doctor today, a little nurse took me back. She had an accent. And she's taking all my vitals and all that deal and everything. And I finally said, where are you from? She just kind of looked at me. Uganda I said we, we said Christmas gifts to children throughout Uganda and Africa she said you do she said that's a good thing she says where do you go to church I said I pastor Emmanuel Baptist Church in Florence Kentucky she said where Florence Kentucky she said I live in Florence Kentucky she's been going to Seven Hills I told her she's living beneath her privileges. I did that, but I was kind to her. Well, I'm trying to help you say, you've got gifts. The Lord opens doors. The reason you ought to give of your silver is not so that when the preacher preaches on giving, you think, boy, I'm, I, I'm not guilty, I gave. It's because when you give... God takes your little and he does much. And lives are being changed. The ministry never sets, the sun never sets on the ministry of Emmanuel Baptist Church. You talk to people that have been here and that go where, you can't go anywhere in Baptist circles, they haven't heard of our church. He told me, he said, you know all these guys, I, they, they've heard of you, I don't know all the guys he's telling me I know of, but they've heard of our church. Why? We are known. This little church for how much we've given across the globe to missions. Amen. We've impacted the world. Ministry requires a heart for ministry. It requires helping the ministry. Can I say there's honor in ministry? You know, those are terms you don't hear much anymore. Honor, character. It was a good thing we went to Seth's graduation last night, and there's several in his graduating class that was already enlisted in the military, and it, it did my heart good when they recognized those, those students. They got a standing ovation. I thought, hallelujah. There's still some that know what the flag stands for. But that's becoming fewer and fewer, farther in between. Honor, character. Can I say, in living a Christian life, character and honor is very important. You ought to have honor. It's an honor to serve God. It's an honor to be a part of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. It's an honor to be able to tell others about Him. But there's honor in ministry. Can I say honor is exemplified, first of all, by keeping a right spirit. You know, the easiest thing in the world is get a foul spirit, especially when you hit that roundabout. I hit it at 60 miles an hour. I'm daring somebody to hit me, man. You can get a foul spirit in anything. But it's honorable having a right spirit. Isn't it always good being around somebody that's got a good spirit? Hmm? You know what the Bible says about having a good spirit, a right spirit? Colossians 3 says this, verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. It's talking about having a right spirit. 
that's honorable. Anybody can have a chip on their shoulder. Anybody can walk around half cocked. Anybody can walk around with a foul spirit. But it takes somebody full of God to have a right spirit. It's honorable. It's not only honorable in keeping a right spirit. It's honorable in remaining steadfast. Mm -hmm. I was watching. I, I like that show. Everybody loves Raymond. And that's sick of me watching. I watch it every night. I like the old guy. The old guy and me have a kindred spirit. We do. Anyway, I like the old guy. Frank, I think is his name. I like him. He makes me laugh. Huh? But can I say this? I was watching it the other night. And Robert, you know, he always feels, that's the older brother, he always feels slighted because Raymond gets all the attention. Well, Robert got an award, three years on the police force, he never missed a day of work. Perfect attendance. Well, Raymond comes in and he gets a bigger award. You know, so the next day Robert calls in, he doesn't go to work. He thinks, what's the use? I don't get the respect of my family. But can I say, there's honor in showing up and being steadfast. There's honor in that. And whether or not anybody else takes notice, God's keeping a record. Huh? 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 58 is one of my favorite verses. Therefore, my beloved brother, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Can I say this? When you're not here, you're missed. And the truth of the matter is, is we're all a link in the chain. And if you don't show up, somebody's got to pull your weight. Mm. Mm. there's honor in keeping a right spirit there's honor in remaining steadfast but there's also honor in being a stronghold it's one thing to be steadfast it's another thing to be a stronghold mm. Second Chronicles 11 verse 11 says and he fortified the strongholds and he put captains in them and store of victual and of oil and wine. And in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. You can't be a stronghold without having unity. And you can't be a stronghold without being fortified. Being built up on the right stuff. And you can't be a stronghold if your foundation's not right. Now, Brother Sammy has asked us to be the stronghold for America for the Caribbean. You know, it don't take many to be a stronghold. It just takes folks sold out. And then God shows up, and he's the majority. Uh, can I say it takes honor? Uh, you read those men that fought for the Alamo. <laughs> they were, the odds were so against them, but they fought. That's why there's still a shrine to them today. Because they were honorable. Listen, I, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. But I do want to go out in the blaze of glory. If I go down, I want to go down giving it all I got. There's honor in that. But let me say this and I'll be done. I'm talking about ministry of ministry trying to help you tonight can I say you got to have a heart for the ministry you got to help in the ministry there's something you can do there's honor in ministry when Jesus comes you want to hear one of them well done thou good and faithful servants there's honor in that if you've ever been to D.C. and saw, saw the, the tomb of the unknown soldier there's great honor in that one of the last times we was there at the World War II uh, memorial there was World War II men there and from the shadows stepped out a guy that played taps it was spiritual I'm telling you it's honor but can I say this there are those who harm the ministry wouldn't it be good if every Christian was just a Christian See, I've only been at this 48 years. I've been preaching 35 of them. And there are some who harmed the ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 says, for, De for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. 
even the great apostle Paul, a man who wrote you know almost half the New Testament, a man who had to be a great preacher. Can you imagine sitting at the feet of Paul teaching and preaching? Even he didn't keep them all. Demas forsook him. <coughs> Having loved this present world, <coughs> there are some that are harmed to the ministry because even while they're here, their eyes are out there. Can I say this? Third John verse nine says this. <coughs> I run. <coughs> I wrote unto the church. Don't know what's in my throat, but it's there good. Hallelujah! It's not cancer. <clears throat> I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. There are Demases who love the world. Then there are Diotrephes who love the preeminence. I can sum that fell up by this: He always wanted to be seen. <clears throat> Good ministers are servants, not captains. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be heard. They just want to do what they can. Diotrephes always has to have the light shining on them. And they're not going to do anything unless they get the credit for it. That harms the ministry. Hmm? If you're doing it for yourself, you're a diatrophies. If you're doing it for the Lord, you're a nobody. But you're somebody to Him. Hmm? Listen. <clears throat> they harm by being selfish. And there are some people selfish. I'm going to meddle. Can I meddle? Thank you, Tommy. I was going to anyway, brother. <laughs> Here's how you're selfish and you harm the ministry. When you want everybody to pray about your special object, but when somebody else has one, you don't take time to pray for them. Now your situation, your tragedy, your lost loved one, whatever it is, is vitally important. I understand that. But so is theirs. And if all you are concerned about is you and what you can get, you're selfish and you harm the ministry and I say this they harm the ministry by being short sighted Proverbs 29 18 where there is no vision the people perish I'm sure there were some when brother Sammy talked about 44 million people said Psh, man, I'm going to reach him many people not with that attitude not I but Christ that liveth in me Hmm? Yes. <clears throat> I'm not going after 44 million I'm going after one and then we'll get one more and then we'll get one more maybe those three will win one maybe those three will win one Maybe. They, and you know what in a short time you've won many but sitting back saying well we can't win 44 million you're not going to win anybody and you're hurting the ministry you're short sighted hmm huh See, I serve a big God who says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. The Bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So if you think you can win 44 million, you can really probably win 144 million with him. See, you're just, your vision's too small. Hmm? I just believe God's able to do everything. As a matter of fact, I believe the only one that limits him is us. Because we're not ministering. We're sitting back doing nothing. But they harm the ministry through being sinful. Isaiah 59 and 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear. And God will not use or bless a dirty vessel. And when there's sin in the camp, you're not going to have the blessings of God. Just go study Achan and what he did to the camp of Joshua. One man's sin costs 
several dozen men their life and hurt the testimony of all Israel. One man. Now, the reason Brother Sammy's here and we've voted to help him is because the church that was helping him sent a man, a young man down to help him. Come to find out, young man gets caught up in immorality. Young man's married and has children, but he's caught up in immorality. And not with women on the island. This man's been going into schools under the umbrella. I'm doing something from Ambassador Baptist Church. The man comes back to the States and he's arrested because his daughter's abused. Now, pray for that man. That man is definitely disturbed. And he's hurt other people. Pray for him. Pray God works in his heart and life. Pray for his family. Pray for his wife. Pray for their church out there. They're having to deal with all this. It's a black eye to that ministry. And Brother Sammy's here because that will hurt the Caribbean when that gets down there when the news gets down there so we have to not harm the ministry be a help to the ministry one poor choice can lead to harming the ministry so I've said all this to say that what are you doing in the ministry you're needed. You are well equipped. Say, Brother Doug, I, I'm not good enough to do anything. Oh, yeah, you are. See, you're listening to flesh and the devil. The Bible says that God's given you ability. Now go minister. Just do it, do what you can. Let's impact Florence, Kentucky. Let's impact Hebron and Burlington, Erlanger, Dry Ridge, Warsaw, Gallatin County. Let's impact our area, our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and let's impact the uttermost parts of the world. Why? Because we got a great God. And I just believe he's so great that we need to let others know how great he is. We need to show them how great he is. We need to worship him in the greatness of who he is. And in so doing, we'll change our world. You know who doesn't change the world? Folks that don't think they can. You know who changes the world? People that are told they can't. But they just keep trying. Hmm? The real testament of character is when you get knocked down that you get back up. So, what are you doing? What do you have to offer God? What are you doing in the ministry? It's time. You do something for Him and His glory. No matter how little no matter how big, whatever you do for God, it lasts forever. Just putting tracks in a bag impacts souls. And going out and passing them out impacts souls. Every facet of what you do can impact souls. So what are you doing? God help us to become ministers of the grace of God. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for our church. Thank you for allowing us, Lord, to be a part of not only Brother Sammy's ministry, but all the missionaries we support. But Lord, thank you for allowing us to take on this burden.
Lord, I don't know how you're going to reach 44 million people, but I believe you will. One way, shape, or form, they're going to know that Jesus loves them. And God, help us to be good ministers. Help us to win our communities. Help us, Lord, <clears throat> to be an ensign to this lost world that Jesus loves them and will change their life. Now, bless now in this invitation. There might be somebody here tonight that's not saved. I pray they'd get saved tonight. Lord, help us not to grumble and begrudge working for you. Help us to do it with joy. Bless now. Speak to hearts. And Lord, we'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.